natural selection is a theory that only the strong survive. If a predator is fast, you need to be faster. If they are strong, you need to be stronger. If they are tricky, you need to be trickier. The key to success is to fight fire with fire. But is that true? Have you ever wondered what would happen if we chose not to best the other person? If we decided not to return evil with evil? Join us today for a surprising lesson in successful living as Kent, Nathan, and Vicky look at Isaac's unconventional choices in Genesis chapter 26. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French, and today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the book of Genesis. If you have a Bible handy and would like to follow along, turn to Genesis chapter 26 as we join their discussion. The Bible's full of encouraging words, but one of the most unencouraging verses I can think of is when Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, 16, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. What, what is Jesus warning us about in that verse when he says that? Well, we're like, we're helpless. We don't have their, <laughs> we don't have their fangs. We don't have their claws. Uh, we, we just, you know, we don't have their intelligence. We're dumber than them. <laughs> we're slower. Yeah. Um, tastier. they seem to have all the advantages right right if ever that seemed to be true it seems that we have an example of that in um, genesis chapter 26 in the life of isaac here god uh, gives a strange command to uh to isaac vicky would you read that for us chapter 26 starting in verse 2. now there was a famine in the land the Lord appeared to Isaac and he said, do not go down to Egypt, live in the land where I tell you to live and I will be with you and bless you for to you and your descendants. I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath. I swore to your father, Abraham. So Isaac stayed in Ger. Does anything seem strange about God's command to Isaac, not to go to Egypt, but to stay in the land of the Philistines? Oh, there's no food. <laughs> yep. And the Philistines are the worst. Well, they're not good neighbors, right? No. Oh, I, I read a book once and they said if they had a slogan, they would say, uh, dog eat dog, right? They, that, that is their slogan. Like, eat or be eaten uh, is how they looked at life. Yeah. They are um, very aggressive people, um, famous for quickly going to war in that dog eat dog mentality. They uh, have excellent technology for their weapons, excellent training. They are idol worshipers, and they were famous for their consumption of alcohol. (laughs) Even now, when people dig in the ruins, they find all kinds of uh, evidence of uh, beer making, for example. They, uh, They know how to drink. So if you take an aggressive person and give them alcohol, that's kind of a difficult, uh, dangerous strategy. And God says, I want you to stay there because this is my promised land. They're not the permanent inhabitants. And I want you to live among these pagan people. So what's his strategy? How is a man of God going to live in a culture like this? Well, we see his first attempt at doing that, starting in verse 7. Nathan, what's he, what's he try first? When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister, because he was afraid to say she is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca because she is so beautiful. Whoa, that sounds familiar. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. like, like father, like son. Uh-huh. <laughs> and how did it work for Abraham? Terribly. Not so well. Not so good. Uh, not so good. And it didn't work out all that well for, uh, for Isaac either. In fact, the story picks up in the verses that follow. Vicki, would you mind reading that for us? Sure. Um, Abimelech saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebecca summoned Isaac and said, she is really your wife. Why did you say she is my sister? And Isaac answered him and said, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. And then Abimelech said, 
What is this you have done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. <laughs> Let's just say Isaac got caught. Yeah. He got caught in his lie, publicly embarrassed, confronted. It, this, this strategy did not work. Lying was not a wise strategy. One might say it was uh, a wolf strategy attempted by a sheep. No. Mm. True. He uh, didn't, quite, uh, didn't quite get away with that. So if that's what's not to do as we live among pagan people, I find it interesting to see what happens next. The next problem for him came up in verses 14 and 15. I'll read that. It says, Isaac had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of their father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Ooh. Is this a serious problem? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You need water Why? to survive. Ah. Especially in the desert. Our bodies are what, 50, 70% water, and it's in the desert? So, um, low humidity, any other reason? Well, they put a lot of work into those wells to begin with. Sure. Right? You know, they, they didn't have, uh, I, I know we, our, our church just sponsored a well over in Uganda. And I mean, it took, they said it was going to take two weeks. It took like six. And huh. they're sending us picture updates throughout this whole thing. And, and they've got all the heavy equipment and heavy machinery. And they're, you know, it's still taking them long. They got to do this by hand. Right. And they don't have steel, right? So, so whatever shovels they're using are uh, are bending and breaking, and they're using sticks to do this. Um, it's a lot of work. I I hand dug out a pit to put my kids' uh, trampoline in, so it won't blow away. Um, uh -huh. That that took me like three days. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent more time shoveling that thing than the kids have spent on on it uh, all year. Long. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a good dad. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and. And what was uh, Isaac's business? What business was he in? Sheep herder. Yeah, he's a uh, sheep guy, wasn't he? Yeah, he's an animal guy. So it's not just his family. He's got all these sheep and whatever, and they all have to drink. And the Philistines knew that. Sure. They were jealous of him, the text says. So they're trying to put him out of business. They want him to watch his animals die of thirst. Hmm. If you were a Philistine and another Philistine did this to you, what would you do? Fill in their wells or steal Fill. their wells or kill yeah. them. Or kill them or escalate Move the situation. <laughs> um, today, maybe it's go to court. Today, maybe it's who knows what. Let's fight fire with fire. So what does he do? What is, what is his strategy? Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar. Wow, he decided to move away. I'm not going to fight over this. Vicky was right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems a lot easier than to take on all the Philistines because they're right. warmongers, you know? Right. Right. So what does he do in verse 19? Well, it says, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, the water is ours. <laughs> you know, you can't blame him for that. And so they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it, saying, Now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. Wow. So they fill in his well, he moves away, digs another one. They steal that one, he moves away and digs another one. What? What is the strategy here? I mean, I, I, Nathan's right. I mean, you've got to dig down a long way to find water in the desert. Nathan, you're talking about a trampoline pit. Um, some dug wells are as deep as 200 feet deep. Yeah. Oh, yep. wow. So they have to be shored up on the sides with stone or wood. They've got to be big enough for at least two guys to, uh, to be digging all the time. One guy can't do, it, can't do that alone. This is a massive investment. And when there is conflict, what does he choose to do? It's like he's a floor mat, right? right. It, it, oh, you're going to wipe your feet on me? All right. What he is not doing is fighting fire with fire. Hmm. What he is not doing is deciding to fight for his own rights. In fact, 
he sounds an awful lot like what Jesus recommended in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Vicki, you're familiar with that passage. I am. It says, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Whew. Wow. Why, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to turn the other cheek? Why is it so hard to go dig another well instead of fighting back or hiring a shark lawyer? Well, I can tell you because you have a lot of chemicals surging through you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, you're angry. You're angry. It's not just. It's not just. No, these, not. these are his wells, and he has worked hard for them. And we have a strong sense of justice, especially when we are involved ourselves. They're yeah. doing evil, and I want to take vengeance for myself. So this is a counterintuitive strategy that is utilized by the people of God when they live among pagan people. Yeah. Have you seen Christians take this approach, turn the other cheek? And if you have, what results? I'm in the process of selling my home, and in the contract from the buyers, they told me I could stay here for X number of dollars and they they wanted me to put down a $1,500 deposit, which just ticked me off. Oh, I was so mad. I remember <laughs> my realtor told me that. Oh, I was so mad. I said, I've been working for months to get this place perfect and they think I'm going to treat it like a rock star the last three days I'm here. I was just, oh, I was so mad. And my realtor said, Vicki, Vicki, calm down, calm down. I'm sure we can get that taken out. But he said, we've got lots of battles ahead. Are you sure you want to fight this one? Mm. So I calmed down and, and not only calmed down, but I decided, because I really do like the buyers. I, I've met them. I thought, you know what? I'm going to write them a letter and welcome them. They've lost four houses in a row and then they got mine. And so I wrote them a letter and said, I hope you're as happy here as I've been. Welcome. I'm glad you got the house and here's why I've liked it. And I hope you like it for all those reasons and more. Well, I heard from their realtor when they got my letter, they broke down and they cried. And after that, we not only were closer, but there were no battles between us. They gave me, I wow. gave them. We've wow. been wonderful friends ever since. Mm. And I found out, this is important too, I told them later, I said, oh, it made me so mad when you put that in there. And they said, we didn't put that in there. And I pointed to their realtor and they said, that was his idea. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, thank you for telling us that. <laughs> and he just put it in there routinely. So we would have been enemies for no good reason. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can remember we had, uh, when our church moved to our current location, our former landlord uh, decided as a parting gift to send us a, uh, a bill uh, for something that we'd already settled. Uh, oh. it, you know, we were already done and it, it was, it was very significant. And uh, so we looked at all of our documentation and, uh, and we really, I mean, we, I, we could have made a case in court, you know? Mm -hmm. So I remember to get to the point where we just said, let's give it to him and be done. Have it in writing that it's done, but but let's just give it to them and be done. We had so many leadership meetings over this, and it was heated. And so to get to the point of turning the other cheek was mm. that that was warfare in and of itself. Sure, right. So we finally we finally you know it finally was like it's not worth it. It's not worth the division it's causing us amongst you know none of none of that. Let's just hand it over, and as you just said, like no drama, right, Vicky. Just mm -hmm. just hand it over, be done. God's going to deal with him and he will deal with us. But but it's, you know, we're we're done. We're not going to seek justice. And uh, and so we we sent it in and nobody was happy about it. But um, we were glad it was behind us. And then the strange thing, it, I think it was the same week we cut that check. I had a, a good friend whose husband uh, had co-created uh, one of these superhero movie things. And she just said, hey, you know, I've been seeing some of the stuff your church is doing, and we got this really big royalty check from Warner Brothers, and we just wanted to bless you with uh, with whatever your church was doing. And it was about the same amount of money. Wow. Um, 
like just out of nowhere. And it wasn't a very good movie um, out, of, <laughs> out of nowhere. Uh, and it was just and everyone who was involved in that decision making just said, OK, God, God says, yeah, I, I will deal with him and I'm going to deal with you and my church will be taken care of. You're not going to go without. Well, that's fascinating because that's very similar to what happened to Isaac when he took that approach. In fact, uh, you can read that for us, Nathan, starting in verse 24. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him with his personal advisor and the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me, since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, We saw clearly that the Lord was with you. So we said, There ought to be a sworn agreement between us. Isaac then made a feast for them, and they mm. ate and drank. Early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they went away peacefully. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Look how that situation suddenly turned in a very unexpected way. It, Isaac might have thought, if I keep doing this, I'm going to do nothing but digging holes in the ground for the rest of my life. I better stand up for myself. But he didn't. He took Jesus' advice and turned the other cheek. Why? Why was this strategy so successful? Well, I think Jesus points that out a little bit later on in those verses in Matthew chapter 5 that you read earlier for us, Vicki. Jesus goes on to say in verse 43 and following. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Hmm. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. We look like our Heavenly Father when we act like our Heavenly Father. God sends rain on the just and the unjust. He blesses the unworthy. He gives grace to those who do not deserve it. That is grace. Mm -hmm. When we do the same, people see God in us. And isn't that what Abimelech said to Isaac? We saw clearly that the Lord was with you. We saw God in you. Mm. I think nothing demonstrates Christ's work in our life more than to respond to evil as Christ did on the cross. He didn't say, Father, kill them all for what they're doing. He says, Father, forgive them. Can we do that? Look, today, many of our listeners, we ourselves, may be legitimately frustrated and angry at someone, a coworker, a neighbor, teacher, relative, how will you respond? Revenge? Or will you help them see God in your actions as you forgive them as God has forgiven you? It's said revenge is a dish best served cold. But that's not what Jesus or the Bible teaches us in this passage. It says instead, don't use the weapons of this world. Revenge is a dish best never served at all. Hmm. It's almost like instead of fight fire with fire, maybe fight fire with water. That's right. Hmm. I wonder if that's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 12. Vicki, would you mind ending our podcast with those verses? Yeah, it's good to remember these verses. Do not repay evil for evil. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Revenge is like a casserole of mayonnaise and Tootsie Rolls. It's not best served hot or cold. It's best not served at all. We are called to serve our enemies, love. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, 
but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more or to support the work of this ministry, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by sharing it on social media and telling your friends. Tune in next Friday as we continue our discussion through the book of Genesis and learn what we can do when our poor choices have led us down a dead-end path. Be sure to join us.